structure of a creature that roamed the earth in the late Jurassic. It's an Allosaurus and it's built with Montmartre make and bake polymer clay. And we'll be making her in this lesson. But before I get into it, if you love art, then jump onto our website at www.montmart.net because we have lots more lessons, as well as links to our art club, The Creative Connect, and our Facebook too. So let's get into it. So I've got an idea in my head of how I want to portray my Allosaurus. Now this sculpture came about from a beautiful construction David Krentz did. His sculpture was not an Allosaurus, but it was a large theropod. And rather than portray it as an overweight, tail-dragging, lumbering behemoth, he instead created a creature whose gait was fluid and dynamic, and inspired me to attempt to create something that I hope conveys the feelings that I felt when I saw his wonderful sculpture. The first step in creating any three-dimensional work is to create accurate plans. For a scientific -y sculpture like this, they have to be accurate and meticulous. Otherwise, you get lots of curry from all the experts out there. This, of course, can be done with a pen and paper, but I have to create a digital PDF for the lesson plan. So I manipulate the skeleton into a plausible configuration. Because he is in full canter, the leg would be almost horizontal, like when a goanna runs. Allosaurus was a fairly lithe creature, so I haven't put too much fat on him. Oh, and don't forget that dewlap. Now my plans are done, which you can get from the Downloads tab under this clip at Montmartre TV at our website. We can embark on the first step, the armature. For the base, I'm using a traditional wooden pallet. And I'll also be using a 3 16 booker rod with washers and nuts, a drill, a 3 16 bit, some two gauge wire and pliers. First drill a hole in a central spot on the pallet. Feed on the washer, the spring washer and then the nut and place it through the hole. On the other side, feed on the washer, spring washer and nut and tighten. Refer to the plans and bend the rod to the desired angle. Measure the plans and make the hip angle bend and then bend the other point at which the femur leaves the hip. I'm using blue tack to mark the bend points. Once the three elements of the leg are positioned, snap the end off. Now we have to make that spine. Cut four bits of wire longer than the spine on the plans. Take one and tightly twist it. Then twist the others onto it. Bend it in half and wrap it twice around the center point of the hip area. Now take more wire and wrap it around the legs and hip and bind it onto the spine. Now do the same with the other leg. Bind it tight so the spine does not move. It is important that the spine is quite rigid, otherwise our sculpture's strength will be compromised. I can't stress the importance of a sound armature. It is our friend's skeleton, and once we add clay, it is too late, so ensure this is right. Next, pinpoint that position of the shoulders, or the arm point. Weave a length of wire through the correct point, Measure the length to the tip of the claws. Create a 180 degrees bend and twist it back to the spine and then around it. Allosaurus bore three large claws. So create another four woven wires and weave these into the appropriate position. Allosauride forelimbs were very large and powerful. Such well-developed arms would have been helpful in grappling prey and dismembering carcasses. Ensure the tips of the woven wire are in the correct position. The inner is the largest. Bind the wire tightly and take it back around the spine. With this amount of wire on the arms, you can be sure they will provide stability and will be very poseable. Now we can adjust the arms, trim the neck and head, and then we can create the body. Before the final cut is made, ensure the animal's pose is correct. Alrighty then, for this next step, you will require some aluminium foil, or if you're American, some aluminium foil. And we're going to use this to bulk out the body. So refer to your PDF and create an elliptical ball 
to fill out that body. It is important to pay close attention to the plan. The worst thing that can happen is you make the body too large, as clay removal is impossible. Make sure too that the ball of foil is compact and tight. This step is important for a few reasons. For one, polymer clay is quite heavy, and the lighter we make our sculpture, the less problems we have with cracking due to excessive expansion and contraction. And large areas of clay don't cure in the middle. Now we can apply some clay. I'm using the Montmart Make and Bake Polymer Clay, and basically what we're going to do is just to create a shell around our body. So take out your clay and give it a bit of a condition. We can then roll a thin consistent layer between our foil. Here's a good tip. I've created two piles of copy paper either side of my clay to ensure the thickness is a uniform four millimeters. I then cut it with a ruler into equal thicknesses and I'm ready to encapsulate the body. As I said before, this uniform thickness creates a really strong shell to build upon. Just cover it up and ensure the edges of the clay meet. Once it's covered, we then smooth out the joints. The smoother this shell is, the stronger it is. Another tip is to dip the modelling tool in water. This helps in blending. Just make sure water doesn't get between the clay you're joining, as it won't stick to itself. While I'm at it, I create an area around the head. This will still give me the ability to pose my Allosaurus prior to the final clay application. Well, I think that's smooth enough. Let's bake it. And if you follow the instructions on the back of the packaging, you should be right. For this next stage, we need tools and more clay. Those were the Montmartre modeling tools and they are fantastic. In the clay tool set, there is 11 pieces and each tool has a profile, either end. And they are made from stainless steel. They are all you need in the way of sculpting tools. You only have to buy them once and you will get many years of enjoyment. This is the filling out stage and it's really just adding and subtracting clay and refining until it looks right. There is a series of views in the third image of the PDF though that will help lots. This filling out stage of a project is what I really love. It is confusing and frustrating, but this is where the form magically appears. If you persevere, it starts to take shape and it's really exciting. The thing I will say at this stage is don't work on any one spot for too long. Just fill out the mass. You can always come back and refine your work. I decided to create a reconstruction of an Allosaurus because it's always been my favourite predatory dinosaur. T-Rex gets all the fame, but Allosaur was one of the most terrifying predators to walk the earth. He reached a size not seen in the time until T-Rex appeared 50 million years later, and it was a very handsome creature. He had an enormous yet proportional skull and big arms. Allosaurus is known from hundreds of specimens, so we know quite a lot about them. As a matter of interest, the remains of an Allosaur were found in the Tashuacon deposits of Inner Mongolia, whose size was approaching the bigger Tyrannosaurus in stature. When you fill out, always ensure there is no air between the armature and the clay. Pay close attention to those claws. This is why positioning of the armature must be correct before any clay is added. Even though Allosaurus on average weighed in excess of two to five tons, it was built for speed, and Gregory S. Paul believes it hunted in packs. The remains of Allosaurus bones were found in Australia as well, and researching this lesson, I read about some tracks in central Queensland where 11 Allosaur-like prints were found, and John Long writes, it took a slightly wavering course as the first strides are longer and deeper than the next four. The last two strides were very short and the animal then turned sharply right for some reason. It's just fascinating to me that that second in time is forever documented. What did it see? <laughs> okay, now for the head. Now I've basically just added and subtracted clay where I needed to 
to follow the shape of the skull. Now don't start this next detailing stage until you are happy with that skull shape. If you refer to the second image in the PDF, you will see some detailed drawings of the face as well as a front view drawing. Now pay close attention to my front view drawing because there's a fair bit of placement information there. So let's get into it and I'll explain as we go. So mark out the line of that top lip and then follow that contour line with a thin piece of clay. Blend it into the head. This is a good way to suggest the fleshy areas over the top of the jaw. Mark in the eye placement, just with a hole for the time being, and lay over a thin sheet of clay and cut it to shape. We can be safe in the knowledge of how dinosaurs' heads looked because they had no facial muscles, just like lizards and birds. Just hide on skull. Don't make the sheet too thick though, or our friend will look like he is wearing a bike helmet. Blend the edges where they meet the face, and remember, we are suggesting skin over voids in the skull. The sculpture really comes alive when we start to refine that head, and my Allosaurus takes on a personality when I cut in the area above the eye. Incidentally, this is called the post-orbital rugosity. And that sounds much cooler than eyebrow bone, hey? Pop on the eye, then create those wonderful ornamental horns that adorned Allosaurus. No one really knows what purpose their horns had, but they were probably used to identify individuals. Add the eyelids and then create the texture around the eyes, then pop on a couple of nostrils. Allosaurus had 14 to 18 top teeth, so I create 16 fine cone shapes. I trim them to size and apply them. The teeth swept back slightly and was smaller at the front. An interesting thing is Allosaurus teeth were constantly replaced through regrowth. That is why their teeth are not that rare as fossils and why they didn't need to go to the dentist. <laughs> now to suggest some dinosaur skin texture. To do this I create a small double-ended shape and dome each end. In one end I use the needle point of a modelling tool and create a series of fine holes close together. And in the other end, I do the same, but with the tip of a pencil. I then bake this, and when it's cooled, I have a negative texture that I can press into my Allosaur to create a positive pattern. This works well because the pattern it creates is not uniform, and it looks quite realistic. And it's really easy to do. Having disproportionately large scales can really take away from the effect of a model. The latest current theory is a lot of theropod dinosaurs were adorned with luxuriant plumage, including showy crests and wattles. It's actually quite plausible to speculate these adornments would have become more intense around breeding time. Male and female allosaurs looked very similar in size and structure, so males would have had to look quite flash to get a mate. The last step before we bake our friend is to apply some ostentatious scale ornamentation on the back of the neck. This is easily created with small balls applied and flattened a little. Some large theropods had these bony additions, presumably to give some protection to the vulnerable area around the spine, a bit like studs on a dog collar. Once we have completed this, we can bake it. Now on baking the finished model, follow the packaging guidelines and don't use the fan forced function. This can cause the clay to dry too quickly and expand. Well I've baked my Allosaurus and I'm really happy with how it's come out. There's absolutely no problems at all. The last step in the building process is I'm going to add some Montmartre modelling paste to create a little bit of an environment for my dinosaur. So let's get that on. This modelling paste is quite thick and it can facilitate many, many textural effects. It can also be painted over. I'm applying it with a palette knife here and I'm applying it fairly thickly. If you wanted to, you could create some dinosaur tracks in the surface. It would also be a great way to suggest mud when painted. I found a rock in my garden this morning and I'm seating it next to my dinosaur. I then sprinkle on some coarse sand. I intend to paint this project so all I'm after is a textural effect. I add some pebbles as well, and voila. 
Well, thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this project. Stay tuned and remember to keep on creating. See you next time.